We're all here because we see a lot of patients with atopic dermatitis and psoriasis, psoriasis and inflammatory mediated diseases. We want to make sure that those patients are well cared for, adequately cared for, not just given a cream and off you go. So when it comes to atopic dermatitis and psoriasis, I think one of the biggest and most important things to take home from today is to realize uh, ourselves, but also be able to effectively communicate to your patients that the stuff they see on the skin, the end organs of psoriasis, the end organ lesions of psoriasis and atopic dermatitis are manifestations of a systemic inflammatory process. When that switch gets flipped for the patients, it oftentimes makes, it, makes them more receptive to the treatments that we can offer them that will allow them to have adequate control of their disease. Um, and atopic dermatitis, as you know, does not roll alone. It's got comorbidities. And our patients with atopic dermatitis are afflicted with the atopic triad. 40, 50 percent of them are going to have allergic rhinitis as well as hay fever. The adult population in the United States and the pediatric population in the United States is affected with atopic dermatitis. With over 36 million, around 10 percent of people in the United States have some form of eczema. And that is not exclusive to the kids or the infants. It's also the adolescents and the adults. So we want to make sure that we're aware of the options to treat them. Psoriasis, if you've ever streamed or watched TV or listened to the radio, you hear a commercial these days. <laughs> when these biologic and small molecule boot camps started, the commercials were not everywhere, but they are now. So, um, but the overall prevalence of psoriasis in the United States is somewhere between 3 and 5 percent in the adult population. But as we'll learn and as we know from the literature, psoriasis doesn't just happen when you're an adult. Oftentimes, the pediatric population is affected. And we'll talk about the sequelae of developing psoriasis at a younger age and specific uh, parts of the body when they're affected in the pediatric population. They have associated risks of developing comorbidities, such as the primary comorbidity of psoriasis. The psoriasis doesn't roll alone. It has its comorbidities. The primary comorbidity at the highest rate would be psoriatic arthritis. We'll talk a lot about that today. But also cardiovascular syndrome uh, and cardiovascular risks and disease are prevalent. And the more intense your psoriasis severity is, the higher those risks can become. We see the picture of our psoriasis patients as a patient who might have a metabolic syndrome. Um, the psychosocial and psychological burden of disease is intense. There are a lot of information about depression and evaluate our patients with psoriasis for depression. These patients also carry a higher risk for getting an inflammatory ocular disease, uveitis, something we want to ask about. And just by the virtue of having psoriatic disease, you have an increased risk of develop developing inflammatory bowel diseases. Also, we do know, unfortunately, and I tell every patient with psoriasis that I start on any treatment, that inherently they also have a comorbid risk for having an increased a chance of developing lymphoma. Nothing is possible uh, unless we can get the medications that we think make the most sense for our patients out of the pharmacies and into the patient's hands. So access to the therapeutic agent that you think makes the most sense for patients is essential for patients to be adequately treated. So the circle of access is huge. And if you don't have a full grasp on it, I mean, I always wish that I had a magic prescription wand where I could walk in the room and I'd say, give them that. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen like that. <laughs> there are a lot of hurdles. So it's really important that you appreciate all the players in the circle of access. Uh, the, the provider, obviously, we're going to make a decision. And then you know, we have to enroll patients in support programs to cover the cost of medications. Um, our sales representatives can be very helpful with that. There are also other people that represent the pharmaceutical industry that are our liaisons to help get medications covered and enroll patients in patient support programs so they get the maximal benefit available to cover the drug costs. These are called field reimbursement managers. 
So you make a decision to write a prescription, I always let my sales rep know, I get the field reimbursement manager involved, and that process is rolling. And there's a lot of different ways it can go, but those two things really can be a rate limiting step. As new medications come to market, and as our existing medications are further studied and get new indications, how do you keep up with the data? It's kind of hard. There's a role um, in most of the pharmaceutical companies uh, called the medical science liaison. These are medical professionals, oftentimes they are PhDs, that are not salespeople. Their role is to make sure that you have your literature needs met and educational needs met from the literature standpoint. So if you have a question, uh, a non-branded question even, about any disease state or a specific disease state, the medical li science liaisons are invaluable resources. So you haven't met, if you haven't met with them, you can always ask your sales rep to hook you up. They can come in and have lunch with you, and they can oftentimes send you literature to help you um, achieve your goals. Pharmacies on the bottom, obviously the medication's got to be dispensed, and so the um, process of whether it comes from a specialty pharmacy or the in-house pharmacies from the, um, the pharmaceutical um, manufacturers themselves, that's another uh, wrinkle to the circle of access. But you've got to be familiar with all the players and streamline a process in your offices so the patients can get access to the medications we want them to have. 